Good morning, everyone. I feel like looking out at our beautiful congregation, I'm saying to myself, this pandemic is really coming to an end. It's, it's just very great to see uh, the room filling up, that we felt everybody's energy, whether you were here or online, and I'm sure many are, so welcome to you too. But it's, it's great to be together. Um, as I think many of you know, in just a couple of days now, um, Sai Ganesh Nivedita Lakshmi and myself will take off for India for uh, three weeks. And um, it's in the midst, midst of what could at least be called a little chaotic, if not some degree of sanity. Um, just interesting how the world works. Even this morning I was thinking, Robert Zadig wrote, not yesterday, but the night before, very sweetly, he said, I can't figure out what the reading is, and I'm supposed to be reading rays, and I want to start practicing. And I was so impressed by that. <laughs> but it was late that he was writing, so I said, I'll send you tomorrow morning, which I did. And I'm sure he's been home practicing. And then, of course, Rita came up and read. They sort of collided midway, and I just thought, Yep, that's just what it feels like right now. But then I asked myself, I wonder what Robert was supposed to learn through this reading because I know he's been reading it over and over. But um, as you all know, we're down a little bit on church staff right now. And it's a very rich and wonderful time in the congregation. Many new people coming just... It just feels, we're, Ananda Palo Alto is thriving, and it just feels wonderful. And we're missing a few staff people, so it feels that too. And then as we come close to this trip, as the universe deals the cards, Sai Ganesh and Nivedita are moving from one house to another. And my partner, Barry, who's lived in a huge home in uh, Menlo Park, is moving, which means I'm moving, <laughs> which means doing a lot of the move in this, from this very big house to another house, which we found a house. It was taken away a few days later. We found another house. It was taken away. Now we think we have a house, but we haven't signed anything. But... That doesn't matter. Yesterday, when I was hoping to be in my home in the community preparing for today, which really means being quiet and inward, reading, meditating, reading, praying, contemplating this extraordinary wisdom, instead, I made about 15 phone calls to sell a piano, and I bought a bed that has to go into the new house, and I arranged with the movers. Then I had to go home and meet back to Barry's and meet the woman who was going to buy the piano. I'm telling you all this for a reason, believe it or not. I walk into the house. I haven't been home all day. So our little dog, Max, with whom I have a love affair, went totally crazy. He just starts jumping and everything in the house, barking. I'm trying to be very sophisticated and bargain for this piano. The more upset Max gets, the more upset Barry gets. <laughs> I thought, any of you ever hear that country western song, Just Another Day in Paradise? You know, it's like the phone's ringing, the, the doorbell's ringing, it's the mailman coming with bills. I go to get the milk, but it's sour, the washing machine breaks. And, and the refrain at the end of all of this all the time is just another day in paradise. <laughs> and I had that feeling yesterday, and I would say, okay, you guys better, really better be with all of us tomorrow. And then I went back to my place in the community and dove deep with this lesson, which was just 
so perfect, really so perfect for all of this um, worldly stuff that's happening, uh, all of the different ways that we could be pulled out and if we're not able to stay right here and let the dogs bark and the movers come and whatever else it is. And of course, it can be much more serious than that. But when I got here and our chanters started singing Sri Yogananda, Guide to Inner Freedom, Steal into My Heart of Hearts, Banish All Delusion, well, it just made me start to cry because really it was such a perfect song for life, for all of what's going on out here, and for this beautiful, beautiful reading. It speaks to all aspects of it, whether we're trying to stay centered in life or whether we are consciously and thoughtfully on this road leading to away from ego consciousness, back to Christ consciousness, which is, of course, the truth inside of all of us, no matter what's going on. But we've been fooled a little by Maya, by delusion, by just the reading from the Bhagavad Gita today, by desires, by attachments, by everything in this world that calls to us in such a strong way that we should be chanting this chant constantly, steal into my heart of hearts and banish all delusion so that we can stay steady. I've had this feeling with this journey that we're about to take to India that it wasn't like, gee, let's go to India. That would be fun and wonderful, which I think it will be. But it feels to me that we're being called there, that we're being taken there to have a profound experience. It's a pilgrimage. There's only four of us going, but it is a pilgrimage. That means we have to be in every moment and no matter what is happening in this worldly way, we need to remember what the larger journey of this life is. So we are getting on a plane. We are flying to Delhi. We are going to go to different places. But really where we're going is deeper and deeper and deeper into our heart of hearts steal into my heart of hearts and banish all delusion. And I feel, if we get ready for that, that this trip could be um, deeply, deeply meaningful. And of course, if it's that for us, it will be that for all of you because we're all so connected. I remember Dunbar saying to me once, when anyone goes into seclusion, or anyone goes on a pilgrimage, all of Ananda benefits from the seclusion or from the pilgrimage. So it just feels like such a whirlwind. And then I find myself crying with a chant, feeling so devotional from a crazy place yesterday to uh, this heart of hearts. And then I knew I couldn't cry because forgive me, but I, I see there are several new people here. And I thought, oh, dear Lord, if I just get up there and cry, they'll think they walked into the loony bin now. <laughs> we cannot have that happening. You know, when um, Swami Kriyananda's mother passed, I heard this story. I was not there, but I heard Anandi, Anaya Swami Anandi, tell this story years ago. She said that um, many people came, many people from Ananda came with Swami Kriyananda down for the service. And it was in an Episcopalian church. And um, 
She said it was rather obvious that there were a fair number of people with Swamiji. So when the priest got to the point where he was going to offer communion, he felt that maybe he should state what the qualifications were for being able to take communion because he wasn't sure who these people were. So when he got all done saying what one needs to be do, which was probably his notion of being a good Christian, um, Anandi said, Swamiji got up and took communion. Several of the people got up and took communion. Some were confused, and they waited a while, but then they went. And a few felt, I don't really fit all those qualifications. I'm sure there were probably more Jewish people there in that group than anything. But anyway, he, she said afterwards, Swamiji took everybody aside and said, never let anybody decide for you what it means to be a Christian. And he was very serious. He said, this is a very personal journey, this journey towards Christ consciousness. And there are many ways to be moving from ego consciousness to Christ consciousness. And as long as we're on that path and making that effort, then we, of course, are good Christians. I know some of you have heard me tell this story of the patient that I was seeing some years ago at Kaiser. I made some mention of the Bible. I have no idea why now. I was, it was a medical clinic, but felt appropriate at the time. And he said to me, oh, are you a Christian? And I thought about it, and I said to him, you know, I am, but I don't think you would think that. Anyway, he wanted to talk about it. We didn't have time. Visits over, and he says to me, so, do you believe that Jesus Christ was the only living son of God and that he died on the cross for our sins? And I said, you know, I'm sorry, but I don't. <laughs> you know, it was like, and then he looked and he goes, how did you know I wouldn't think you were a Christian? You know, because if we don't fit, this is who Swamiji was referring to as thieves and robbers. If we don't fit into the notion that's been passed down, and it's not just by quote unquote Christians. I, I know many uh, rabbis from my own experience, probably in every religion, we're talking about people who would espouse truth based on an intellectual understanding of something at best. Now, Swamiji says, and it was such an important line that he put in here, um, where he said, even those who were genuinely trying to help people, most of those people still have some ego. That's not the problem. The problem is when people serve other people for their own good. That's really what the reading was about. Um, in every tradition, Western and Eastern, there is some notion of, like in the West, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, uh, in the East, it's Sat, Tat, and it's Sat, or Father, being that which is outside of creation. And the Tat, or the Son, is that being that comes beyond ego. No need to be reincarnated, but comes as a perfect reflection of what was before creation. This is how Jesus came. This is how Krishna came. This is how Buddha and Moses and many others came. They came as perfect reflections of that which is indescribable, that which is infinite, that which is, as Yogananda says in his poem, Samadhi, beyond imagination of expectancy, 
Our minds can't go there. But how are we ever going to try and get there, given how big cosmic consciousness, Christ consciousness is? We need way stations. And these avatars come. And they take a human body. And of course, Yogananda told us, the ego is the soul identified with the body. So, of course, they come with, as soon as they're in that body, there's some ego that they're dealing with. But as Yogananda so sweetly said, he said, taking on a human body or an ego is like putting on a heavy coat on a hot summer day. And that is precisely what all of us do. We are living not in our infinite consciousness, which is ours. It's right there. It's right behind this very thin but tenacious and tricky veil of delusion. It is tricky. It's slippery is what that veil is. So it seems very gauzy, like we could just push it away. But there's so much here pulling us back and down. The piano really did need to be sold. The house needs to be found. The little puppy needs to be trained. I mean, all of these things are going on, and they're very real. But what we've done is we've taken ourselves, and we've allowed that soul to be encased in this body, we hold everything. A few weeks ago, I was talking about it like compressed air. Until we begin to awaken and we see that we're in a cage, we're caught. It begins to feel too small, too tight. Then we start this journey. Then we start moving towards all of the truths that Jesus came to teach or Krishna came to teach, everything that's stated in this reading. I mean, Jesus, who said continuously, and then Swamiji, a master, quoting him, I and my father are one, and everything I am, you are too. How many times were we told they didn't come to show us how great they are, they came to show us how great we could be if we would listen, open, expand into, into our true nature here. And all of us have been, we have this, we carry with us the uh, knowing of all of that greatness. We have it but it's gotten not just buried. It's like Maya is an anesthesiologist, and it's put us all to sleep. So it's back there. Somehow, we know, but we're not living it. But we are moving. We are inexorably drawn towards that state of everything I am, you are too. It keeps beckoning to us. It keeps calling us. That is the greatness of God and how much we're loved and that magnetism of God and gurus that keeps not letting us rest. None of us who are here, we are the true Christians. doesn't matter what our original religion was. That's why there's that wonderful saying, it's wonderful, it's, it's no doubt a blessing to be born into a religion, but it's a, I, don't, I forget what the word is, but a curse or something, to die in one, because we don't want to be confined by that. It's not who we really are. We are so much bigger than that, and we need to do what the masters have done, vanish the veils of light and shade. They've done that. We need to do that. We need to listen to the words of this chant and just keep awakening 
because that's what it is. That's the depth of the meaning of the word smriti, this deep knowing inside, this isn't who I am. I don't belong all locked up. And look at what Master did. I was thinking about this in just a few ways because I'm aware I'm not saying anything most of you don't already know. You know, truth is one and eternal, and in the end, it's kind of very simple. We stand up here week after week, or we all take classes together. We try and find more and more and more ways to say the same thing. But that's what we're doing, because as we hear it again and again and again, that little memory says, wait a minute, I remember that. Wait a minute, I'm not going to get shaken by all of what's going on. I'm on my way to India to meet the masters. I'm going to stay right here. I can do this. Of course I can do this. Jesus told me, master told me, Swamiji came and told us, all of the great ones say it. Yes, you can. So of course we can. They didn't say, well, you can, but you can't, and you won't, but you will. No, every one of us, it's already there. We just have to part, part the veil. That's all we need to do. I thought about, we talk so often about the techniques, because how many tools are there? So I wanted to just mention a couple of our techniques in a different way than we usually do. And then I want to talk about loyalty, which I just have been reading a lot about because of this course that we have going on where every other week we're looking at one of the essentials on the spiritual path. And Friday night, it was loyalty. And it's so profound. Of course it would be. Yogananda said loyalty is the first law of God. What did he mean by that? What do those words mean that it's the first law of God? Well, let me come back to that. He came and he gave us a lot of techniques. I'm not going to go over them. But as I was thinking about them yesterday and thinking about our energization exercises, for instance, most of you know them, many of you don't, a simple series of 39 exercises, all taught, all brought to us by Yogananda, um, who perceived them and then gave them to us, to show us, as we do them every day, at least once a day, without saying the words exactly, we are practicing, I am not this body. I am not this body. I am energy. I am expansive. I am infinite. I am energy. They're called the energization exercises to put us in touch with that reality, with this reality, that we are all walking this path towards cosmic consciousness, that we already have that. We already are cosmic and conscious. We are infinite. And we do those exercises. And as soon as we can learn them and get out of the what comes next, what do I do? Does this take a double breath, doesn't it? We just get into a flow. So for 15 minutes, once or twice a day, we're practicing. I am energy. He brought us and told us to meditate. He brought us techniques. He told us to meditate on the um, qualities of the divine, to meditate on peace, on calmness, on love, on power, on sound, cosmic sound, cosmic power, sound, ohm, the comforter, that vibration out of which everything was made manifest. Yogananda came and he said, meditate on these qualities. The first technique, which anybody can find on the internet, come to us, we could teach you in an hour. Hong Sa, I am spirit. I am that. I am God. 
And we practice it twice a day, repeatedly. Do it consciously. It helps us awaken ever more perfectly to our truly divine nature. Again, it's what we want. We are true Christians, which just means getting on that path. Ego, soul. Con constricted, expansive. That's what we want. I wanted to, so let me just finish that little section and say I could go on. We could talk about the OM technique when Shama was talking about the mantras outside and she realized there were some newer people. She said, if you don't know the words, just listen, be bathed by it, she said, because there's a vibration to the mantras more important than the translation, the vibration. It's the vibration of Om. It's the vibration of creation. So every Sunday when we're using these mantras, we have been given enough tools that we could be slipping into one of them every moment of every day until we begin to feel who we are. We begin to feel the Father within, we begin to know without a doubt, I and my Father are one. I just wanted to share this, something that Swami Kriyananda wrote about loyalty, because, of course, I'm not going to try and do the class over, but it's very powerful that Yogananda said repeatedly, I must have read it in 10 talks that he gave, it's in books. Swami Kriyananda always quoted it. Loyalty is the first law of God. Now we're talking about how do we help ourselves remember who we are. That's the topic of the whole reading here. Swamiji says, the most important aspect of being a true disciple and overcoming the tests on the path is the commitment of loyalty, the commitment of trust. Master, who's Yogananda, said that loyalty is the first law of God. Even while he was living, many disciples would go rushing from one teacher to another, but they didn't get God. One has to be loyal to one's way, to the way God has sent, meaning our gurus find us. Once we've taken discipleship, once we know we're on our path, there can't be any question. Or as Swamiji says, we find ourselves with one foot in two boats and we fall in the middle. We have to stay loyal. By doing this, loyalty, be loyalty becomes such a direct pipeline to the spirit that we're totally absorbed in that vibration. And then, so if we just practice and stay conscious of what it means to be loyal, not to the man Yogananda, not to the man Kriyananda, not to the organization of Ananda, but to the truth behind all of it. That's what loyalty means. It means We've experienced truth, and we're going to stay loyal to it. Swamiji says further on here that when he first met Master, he said, even a week before, I had never heard the words guru, yoga. Nobody was talking about that then. And these are his words. He said, I was in a state of mental turmoil. Now, he was 22 years old, mind you, with all the new thoughts being thrown right and left by disciples who took them for granted. But he said, here was how, how I just want to quote him. He said, the only way for me would, was to have absolute faith in what Master said. So when somebody would tell me something that made no sense, how many times does that happen to us? Or maybe it makes sense, but we can't even, we can't do it. He said, I would always say to them, did Master say that? And if they said yes, I was all in. That was it. 
whether it made sense or not. Now, I just want to keep reminding us this is not a new topic. This is technique. This is loyalty. This is right attitude. This is courage. This is all, these are all of the things that we're talking about in this year or two long course. How do we get on the path and stay on? Because we're being called. We would not be here if we weren't being called. And I'm saying, wow, look at this. There's, I don't want to say an infinite number of ways, but maybe there are, because we're all so different. But there are certainly a huge number of ways that have been put right in front of us. They've been handed to us that we can do. Do the techniques that an avatar brought to us. He wasn't just trying to waste our time. He wasn't. And remember, Maya is slippery. Nobody intends to be greedy. Nobody intends to lie. Nobody intends to steal from other people. But we do. How does that happen? We just start twirling off over here. We've been given everything we need to stay true to our course. So I started out by saying, wow, it's a little crazy these days and a little chaotic and a lot going on. So what? So what? So the doorbell's ringing, so the mailman's bringing bills. So we're trying to pack our lives into boxes and unpack them in the next house. Really, what difference does it make? There's only one thing that matters, and that is our dedication our devotion, our commitment to what our heart is telling us is true, what our soul knows beyond a shadow of a doubt. And that is, we are one with God. We are in that love with the divine. We've forgotten, we've been put to sleep, but we are waking up and we can accelerate that course to any degree that we want. It takes a little effort, but what else are we doing here? So let's remember, really, it's the simple things in a way. It's all that's simple that just keeps bringing us back home. Whenever we're drawn out, we say, wait a minute, I don't belong over here. No, I belong here. Let me come back. Let the dog bark and the man yell. I'm coming back. I'm calm. I'm peaceful. Master's holding my hand. And he always is. God bless you.